would do that. None of us would do that. Like that. <laughs> super good. There, but there was a time where one of us would do that, I think. Man. It's not like the kid knows, man. Exactly. The kid's won. Yeah. The not game was good. It was a good game. It's not the kid I'm worried about. Welcome, everybody, to Dat Poker Podcast, episode 165. This here show is presented by Danny and Legrand's Masterclass in Poker. I'm your host, Dave Schwartz, alongside uh, producer extraordinaire Roscoe P. Coltrane with the Expo. Hey, how are you? Uh, Terrence Chan, T, how are you? I'm doing well. That is an excellent hat. And then Daniel, looking like a, like a professional gamer of some yeah. type, going on there. I'm feeling a little feeling a little set envy. Yeah, you got the, the stream situation set up. You got the GG stuff going. That's a professional looking exercise over there. Yep, we're updating stuff, making it look clean. And I see Adam, you've upped your game from prison background to you know you're like you're like in a halfway house now. You know you're like on your way out of prison. So that's good. <laughs> Uh, I cut my hair like I'm in prison. Look, that's the, that's the prison. <laughs> What's look. the hat for? If you got your hair, like, I mean, I'm wearing a hat because I just took a nap. I was tired today. I didn't want to do my hair. But for you, you have none. So the hat is just. It's cause... for Canucks. It's my support for Canucks ah. hockey, baby. We're going to get to that a little later. We got. Some... It also reduces the glare. <laughs> Off the forehead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, speaking of Masterclass, Daniel, I just signed up for Masterclass. It's been whatever, how many years we've been doing this, and I haven't signed up. But I just paid the big bucks to sign up for Masterclass. I kind of did it for my kid because he's into music now and stuff, but uh, uh, got all all access. So I'm looking forward to uh, rolling through some of the poker stuff. Should be fun. Yeah, that's what I think a lot of people don't know about Masterclass. Like if you, you know, if you, if you sign up to Masterclass, you get a yearly subscription, but you get everything. So like what we found is people that buy it, you know, for whatever reason to watch, you know, to learn about music, cooking, sports, you know, politics, you name it. Like it's a wide variety of things. People have been per- like just jumping into poker at a high rate. Like I know that because I can see what our my royalty check looks like every quarter and it's still very, very good. So um, I think like when we did Masterclass, part of the thinking behind it is, you know, there's a lot of courses that are done for the poker community specifically. Right. And uh, this one is for everybody. So people buy, people are essentially buying the poker class without buying it. But now that they have it, they're like, you know what? I find this interesting. And I remember when they approached me, they asked me, I asked them, I was like, well, do you want me to do something that's like super high end or more for beginners or whatever? And so they said, you know, they said, well, we typically feel like high end works better. And I oh. started to explain some high end and they're like, uh, maybe not that high end. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you know, stacked, you know, so, so basically what I did was I, you know, I feel I'm very proud of the job we did at like explaining really complex concepts in a way that's palatable to the wide majority, the wide variety of people. And I think I'm uniquely qualified to do that, especially since a lot of modern poker theory is new to me as well, or at least was a few years ago. So I'm sort of like explaining to them in the way that I learned and how to like, uh, you know, I speak English. I don't, you know, you know, you can't talk like, I remember when I was learning chess from Gotham, I did a lesson with him and he's saying D7, B6, G, D. I'm like, but I don't know where the fuck that is. You know, slow down a little bit. You gotta help me out. I thought you I, I thought the content you did recently with, with Alex Botez joining GG was good stuff. It was fun to watch the heads up match, watch a little of the dialogue that you did with her because I think I feel like she's in that situation. She's like mm-hmm. somebody who's astute and trying hard and learning, but obviously like isn't quite there yet. Um, you know, th- I thought that was like a fun way to sort of get some poker theory out there without it sounding like, oh, here's Daniel lecturing about blockers and, you know, and flop textures and stuff like that, because not everybody wants to read hear about blockers and flop textures and bet sizes. I got to tell you, first and foremost, you know, she's a genius with this stuff. She really knew what she wanted to do with her intro to GG. And I was amazed at how well it flowed. Like generally what we thought would happen is, you know, you're going to shoot for all, you're going to edit it up into different, you know, like we didn't, it's just the whole thing. That was just us playing it out. And there were some really cool moments. One that's gone viral, and I've seen people do some videos of it, was, you know, she's asking about tells and how to read tells, right? <laughs> and then, like, not, not not five minutes later, she has A6 and three, you know, she thinks about three betting. I see that. I have king, queen. Now it comes A6-4, right? And she does this. She does one of these. She goes, like, glances right at her chips. So the, she checks the classic out. Mike Caro, VHS Mike Caro from 1991 <laughs> most, or whatever. It's right? the most basic one, but it's just some, and it was all organic. Like it just happened in real time. And 
I think, um, well, she's really sharp. She knows how to do media stuff and the conversation really flowed. We touched on a lot of topics from, you know, online poker to cheating to, you know, everything. And we did so in just a very conversational way. And I'm super, I think she's like, you said something important too. I watch her vlogs and I'm like, this is awesome because it's like living vicariously through somebody who's just like kind of learning, you know, mm. like she's in spots that I wouldn't be in. She's in spots that Stephen Chidwick wouldn't be in. She's got decisions to make and you see the mistakes she makes. And sometimes, you know, okay, well, this is a really big blunder. You don't see, but, but that's relatable, I think, to a lot of people. So um, really glad to have her on board. She's a, she's an asset for sure. Uh, been a while since we did a show, Daniel. You were flying all over the world. We'll get to some of the stuff, uh, get caught up. Uh, but in the meantime, time is flying by. The World Series of Poker is six weeks away, and, and it's coming up on us fast. It seems like it comes faster every year. Uh, we went through the schedule. Uh, we went event by event. Uh, if you want to go back, if you're new to the show and you want to go back and hear us chat a little bit about this World Series of Poker schedule in the last couple episodes, we went through the schedule. Uh, but one thing we didn't go through was the online World Series of Poker events uh, because they weren't out yet. And they're still not out, which is a bit weird. And I'm wondering what's going on here because these are usually announced alongside the live events. And I don't. Is there a problem with with some of the with the World Series of Poker website or what's going on? Any insight on that, Daniel? I just think it's a case of just like having not gotten to it. <laughs> There's okay. a lot going on. Um, but I would listen for those that play this. You know, the online events. It's most likely going to be very similar to what we saw last year, which means you know, at one or two events on Sunday, Tuesdays having an event, and then like maybe one other day once in a while. Um, but you can you know you can probably count on every Sunday something you know being there. Um, but I have no input on the online stuff. You know, we put in some, put I put in a decent work on the, the structures and, you know, they do a great job with the schedule. We talked about that before, how it's like this, it's a mosaic, it's a puzzle, right? Like everyone has their idea of what's important to them. So you have to think, okay, you have Terrence Chen. He's like, when do the limit Hold'em, Badoogie, and Deuce to Seven single draw events happen? And if they overlap, I'm screwed. It's like, okay. That's you, bro. You're like one guy. You know what I mean? And then you have Adam who's like, well, when is the PLO that goes with the freaking double board bomb pot? You know? So I think they do a really good job um, of like putting it all together. So there's a little something for everybody. And, you know, as we talked about, one of the things I think is cool for all the 10K championship events, the 1500 is that same week, a few days before. So you win the 1500, Boom, you jump into the 10K and, you know, uh, you get, so if you're a stud player, you know, you come in for that week and you get to play both your, your specialty events. Um, a lot of the similar storylines we look forward to in the World Series of Poker every year are probably going to, uh, you know, revisit them again. Uh, we talked about uh, Becker versus Tice, the, the side bet you've got going, Daniel, with your boy Becker and wondering, you know, where that's at or are you, are you closed for action? Are we still negotiating? What's happening with uh, with the terms there? Okay, so I can say I'm very happy with how it, you know, how it played out. We've essentially, we haven't written out the uh, written document, but we've agreed to the terms. Okay, and again, I, as I said in the last podcast, I was a little bit concerned about, you know, their side having side bets on how, on just like, you know, that's different than ours. It's a full cross cut. We don't care that side bets has no influence on us. However, when knowing that he did already book a bunch of side bets, you know, potentially a million dollars worth, like him having input in the rules, it was very important, I thought, for me to make sure that, like, they're not set up in such a way where they can manipulate it. For example, you know, originally we had the idea that, if you, you know, we have to play 25 tournaments, right? So what if after 25 tournaments, Landon's up $300, right? And if he just quits, they win. And he may, you know, it's worth like a million dollars just to like do that. So that, that couldn't be the case. So we've come up with a perfect solution, I think. It's no longer mutually played, if you will. It's an open season, Okay. All the events count the world. All the live events count the World Series. No online. The win, Venetian. All the events around town are going to count. Every bullet is going to count. Okay, um, as a cross book, and you know you can just everything with 10k or below, and it all counts. But we're going to do a 250k cap with an additional, I believe, hundred thousand bracelet bonus. One caveat to that is that one needs to be mutually played for it to count for the 100k. And then anything above 10K, you know, we'd have to agree to before as far as, you know, where they're going to book it. But for example, if Landon's in a 5K, he's 100% booked, if, even if Jeremy's in it or not. And this, oh, okay. this, this deal, this sort of like, you know, uh, fixes the issue of any sort of angling and, and stuff like that, which like Berkey didn't understand. As you saw, we talked about this. Like Sean Deeb had to point out to him that like, you know, if every bullet doesn't count for one and it's an unlimited rebuy, then you're incentivized to go crazy because 
you'll have more chips. Um, secondarily, you know, if it's a cross book, seeing how somebody's doing after level six, like he didn't seem to think it mattered. It does, right? If a guy has busted, wow, you're free rolling. If he's got the chip lead, don't play, right? So we've avoided all those problems. I'm, I'm happy with the way that it uh, looks in terms of um, the, you know, the, the details. And uh, I'm super excited for, because I think it's going to be, like you said, you know, a really cool storyline throughout the series of like, you know, the guy who learned with machines, right? Versus the one who just watched a lot of poker and played a lot of poker. And it does never like, doesn't even own a computer. So I think it's going to be fun for like poker fans to sweat all summer. Can you explain the 250,000 cap? So 250,000 per event. So let's say, for example, um, you know, Landon cashes for 365. Well, congrats, but it'll be 250 cap. Okay. So I mean, it's just so, I mean, if somebody wins the main event, you can't just bankrupt the other guy, you know? Yeah. And the other thing I think we did, I have to double check, but we agreed upon with the bounties and the mystery stuff. Like, I don't know how to do this, but we're just going to come up with a fixed amount of what they were. Because I don't like the idea of just like, oh, look at that. He pulled a card, won a million. You know, that's stupid. Yeah. So we're going to have, a, you know, just a fixed amount per bounty. And, and Yeah, you can, it's probably easy to figure out what the equity of one bounty is, like the average bounty. Yeah. And it'll all number. be no limit hold'em, just live. That's it. Nice. And how's, has Jeremy downloaded a, a solver? Is he doing any other new fancy On, onto his phone? Like, yeah, I mean, no, I don't want to. Like, honestly, I avoid at all costs. Like, we talk about hands occasionally. He just bubbled in Florida. He played the 10K Turbo. He was direct bubble. He's been running pretty bad. Like, I've been watching. He's played in the studio this week, building up big stacks every day. Um, but I think what a lot of people miss, they don't really see, get about these studio events, is they're fast structures, right? So. After rebuy period, you, you're going to have all ins, and if you win those, you know you're you're, you're in good shape. But when you don't, you're just out, right? Like you'll see, it was almost like Seniors Week. No joke. This week was like Seniors Week at the World Series. Eric Seidel wins one. Eric Afriat wins one. Dan Shack makes final table. Bill Klein's in there in the money. You know, I come second. <laughs> it's like I'm like you know, you know but uh, but part, you know, it was it made me think about it too because like some of the players there, I'm not going to name names because it's not important, but like. You can, you will actually, I'm not saying you're going to be plus EV, but you will cash a decent amount if you just play tight, right? Just play tight, be there, and then just go all in when you have something. That's it, right? Play tight, play tight. You know, you're not going to have a big stack, but you're going to cash at a decent clip by doing that, right? And you see a lot of players who do that. You wonder like, wow, they seem to be cashing a, you know, a, a decent amount. Um, but as you know, the way tournaments work, it's, it's really about one, two, and three. So while you'll cash a lot using that strategy, and if that's fun for you, go for it. Um, it's gonna, it's difficult to like build enough chips to win. But I see it. Like I mean, like I said, like I said, I'm not gonna name any names or at all. But you see some players that are not professionals, and you often see them there deep. You know, you see them even like I'll tell you what, even a guy like Helmuth, right, who max late regis, right, max late regis with 20 big blinds, and he's like, oh, you know, we go deep. He, I was sitting with Eric Seidel, and uh, Phil Helmuth comes up and says. Look at that, Eric. You know, we're just every, we're all deep, deep, deep every tournament. And I go, Phil, you start the tournament deep. Like, we're already deep when you start. We're, like, we're close to the money, you know? Um, so, really, like, if you think about what Phil has to do, like, with, with his 20 bigs, he needs to, you know, play tight, play tight, find a spot, double. You know, now he's in action. Now he can continue to play tight, pick his spots, whatever. And all of a sudden, you know, he's close to the money. And then anything can happen. So, they're a lot of fun. I think they're, it's a good thing that they're high variance because like anything, if you play any game and, and one person never wins like chess, if I played, I don't know, somebody better than me at chess by a lot and I never win, it's demoralizing for one and two, I'm probably not going to want to continue to play. It's just not that fun. Right. So that's why I think the structures are perfect. You know, it's one decent solid day and then a pretty quick final table on day two. Well, and I think that's part of why, um, payout structures have evolved the way they are. I mean, I'm sure Daniel and Adam, you guys remember when barely 10% of the field got paid. It was sometimes, once in a while, it was even less than 10% of the field. And then it started expanding 13, 15%. I think online really started to kick this off because the online operators realized like, hey, if we only pay 10% of the field, like people just go broke too fast. There's, it's not easy to get money in online. And so we want to keep this money circulating into the system. And it's now, now live venue. And now you've got, uh, you know, a 
it seems like, especially in the very big buy-ins, a, a very high percentage of the field getting paid. And part of it is keeping that money in circulation, but a part of it is also that psychological feedback mechanism of, hey, I cashed. I 1.7x my money. Like I made a profit. It feels good to go home with a profit at the end of the day. And yeah, like these guys who, who cash at a very high rate, like it may not actually be profitable in the long run because if you're again, like Daniel points out, if you're if you're never if if you're never getting a podium finish, um, then you know you'll still finish out of the money often enough to take yourself into negative territory. But it still feels pretty good to to hit those caches. To echo that point, you know about payout structures. I just it just came in 1997 in Foxwood. I played a hundred dollar limit hold'em, one hundred dollar buy-in, no rebuys. Okay, one hundred dollar buy-in. I won seventeen thousand dollars. <laughs> like it was a big field tournament you know for back then and it was like 50 percent for first you know that's how they used to do things yeah i see yeah uh, yeah, that was what yeah 50 percent for first it would just be unfathomable and like that that tournament probably had like a thousand players in it yeah something like that i saw a recent discussion i think it was ella she she was you know a few sort of um semi-pros or mid-stakes pros were arguing that you know 15 percent is not good for the poker economy or it's not good for the pros and stuff and it's like they thought like paying less would be better because then you could get like a higher, you know, min, min cash or something like that. And unfortunately, like I looked at their math and it just doesn't make sense. Like one of the, so any sort of payout structure you have is either going to benefit recreationals or pros. It cannot be both by definition, just can't be both. Right. So the question is when you pay less spots, who does this benefit the most? It benefits the best players. And it hurts. It, it hurts in two ways. It hurts the the recreational weekly players so they don't cash often enough. And also, sort of what we're talking about, Terrence, is that because they don't cash as often, they become less likely to continue to play. So yeah. I like the fifteen percent. I don't have a hugely strong opinion on it. I know that like people look at it and go, "Man, I bought in for fifteen hundred, and I only got like twenty three hundred back." I'm like, okay, well, you know, I mean, at least you got something. And we'll catch next it. time. Have a bigger stack next time. Yeah, or yeah. exactly that. The other thing, by the way, that hurts uh, recreational players and helps pros is large jumps. So like a large a large bin cash is definitely always going to help pros because they play more correctly around it. Um, well, it's so, a crazy tournament too, right? If you had, yeah. let's say, for example, the min cash is like, let's go extreme, 4x the buy-in. Right. Now you're going to look at like four tables out. All the pros are just going to sit there and stare at each other and yeah. like you know, stall because it's smart. And yeah. the recs won't know you know, that's the thing to do. And then they're not going to understand how tight you have to play. So yeah, I actually, if or any- even if they do know, they don't want to participate in this. Cause that's, that's me. Like I hate this shit and I hate yeah. this stalling. I play poker for fun now. And, and, and I, it drives me crazy when this stuff happening. So you drive, drive these guys away from the game when you have, if you, if you, yeah, like you said, you have this very obscene cause people are stalling for 1.4 X buy-ins imagine the incentive you create when you stall for a bigger a, a bigger bubble yeah the smaller the min cash percentage wise mm-hmm. the more smoothly the bubble theoretically should go but right. that the issue is like you say you know a lot of these pros who play these tournaments with like two thousand players three thousand players like you know they're they're trying to live off min caches because that's what you're going to do most often because mm-hmm. it's hard to get deep and so it doesn't feel like you can support yourself and that's probably true right those are very difficult events to say i'm a professional poker player and my bread and butter is playing 1,000 player fields and stuff like that because you're just so rarely going to hit the big. So if you are playing those, you know, and you're playing them, you have to look at them more like a lottery a little bit. And the way that I approached my career was I play cash games. That's my job. Okay. Yeah. The tournaments are my opportunity to maybe hit something big. They're enjoyable and maybe like elevate my bankroll, but I can't count on those to like pay my bills. So that would be the adjustment I would tell those people is that. You know, if that's your, if that's what you do, you know, you play these big field events, understand that like, you know, you, you don't have control over variance and you need a lot of good things to happen to make really significant money in those. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that uh, the other person or people or entity that it helps when you make flatter payouts is the house, right? So you've got the house and the recreational players on one side and the pros on the other. And guess who's going to win that one, right? So, um, (laughs) and that's why we got away from 50% for first. Uh, for from a long time ago, uh, Terrence, have you locked down your uh, World Series of poker schedule? You booked? You going down? I did. I'll be there May twenty, May thirty to July, uh, June thirteenth. So, oh. yep. Like as Daniel's pointed out, it's draw events and limit hold'em events, and I'll be hanging around. I'll be hanging around doing that. 
not going to be playing the tournament of champions, even though I'm eligible. There's the bracelet again. Um, so I'm eligible for the TLC, but I will not be making it down to the commerce. Uh, some controversy I'm sure you guys saw about the TOC being relocated to the commerce. So yeah, unfortunately, I would I would have loved to play in that and just be the absolute stone cold worst no limit hold'em. Basically, like everybody in that tournament has won a bracelet, and ninety percent of them won their bracelet in some form of no limit hold'em. And so I would have been fun to be the stone cold worst player for a free roll in there for about a thousand bucks, but I, I will not be. Sad. I don't, I'd take the over on that. I don't think they're the worst by far. <laughs> but yeah, but I'll be there. But I'll be there. I got my Airbnb booked on the east side of the strip. So oh. got so used to booking my Airbnbs on the west side of the strip back at the Rio, but on the east side of the strip, of course, this time. And uh, yep, I'll be there. You'll see me. Uh, yeah, I got the urge again. I uh, I went down to Vegas for about three weeks. Uh, about uh, well, I just got back a couple of weeks ago and. Played played a bunch of cash, played a tournament or two, and uh, I got the itch. So I think I'm gonna uh, get my ass down there for three weeks a month and, and camp like old times and uh, and stick my nose in there. Mostly cash games, but I'll probably put my uh, put my nose in an Omaha tournament or two. Um, and uh, I so I was down there and uh, Justin Hammer. I think you guys know Justin. He he runs the Poker Atlas Tour. Um, and they were across the street over at uh, resorts, so I wandered over there to see some friends, and and I played my first tournament in six or seven years for sure. Uh, Omaha eight or better, it was okay. I'll play Omaha eight, and uh, ended up binking it for like eight k or something, so that was good. Um, and uh, got the itch to play tournaments again. It was a one day tournament, which are the best. It was it started at like two in the afternoon, ended at five in the morning. It was like because <laughs> it was an 08 tournament, eight hours. <laughs> of torture, but, uh, but had a great time and yeah, I got the urge to, to, to jump in there again. But, uh, then I got my cell phone stolen. So that wasn't fun. Uh, I had to deal with that. <laughs> uh, Vegas is Vegas and, uh, I'll be down there for sure. You so, lost it at the strip club. Did I, get I, me a break. I was not at the strip club once. And I even, I even <laughs> that, but, uh, no, it got stolen as I, I was playing video poker after a session, uh, and won one of those four way video poker facing each other. And I just put it down beside me. I'll go to look back and it's gone. Like, what the fuck? Where did my phone go? I, I just had it a minute ago. So I ran up to my room and, you know, find my iPhone now. I'm like, okay, where the hell is it? It's driving. I see it like moving towards North Las Vegas to the oh worst it is. Yeah. Probably over where your Airbnb is booked, Terrence. But that, yeah, it's like trucking. And it, they're going directly to the pawn shop. At least you know what pawn shop it ended up at. So it ends up at a house. And so now I jump on Google Maps and I. Google map the or Google map the house and it's a trailer in a trailer park. I'm like, oh Jesus, is this guy like so uh I, I was like, well, now what do I do? Do I go knock on the door and say, hand my phone over? It's like the worst scenario. And I put it on Twitter. I was like, I said to put a map and I'm like, hey, Las Vegas people, is this bad area? Like what, what's gonna happen? <laughs> and then people are like, is your is your thousand dollar phone worth your life? Then go get it. Um but it's funny because uh, Joey Ingram, a uh, uh, Las Vegas cop, and Joey commented on my post. And a Las Vegas cop who follows Joey sends him a DM and says, "Hey, I'm a Las Vegas cop. I see where this is my area." But he was he was off. But he I, I started DMing him in, in Twitter. But his partner was working that night. His partner goes to the guy's house. And oh my it's a felony! Like it's over a thousand or whatever it is. It's a felony. So he knocks on the door. He's like, "Hey, you got our you got a, somebody's phone here. Hand it over." So. I went and got my phone and brought it back to me, which was awesome. The uh, power of social media. Yeah, exactly. I'm just glad the cop didn't get hurt because then it would have been all your fault. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> true for sure. Uh, speaking of World Series Poker, Daniel, people are asking about your package. What's going to happen? No, so your your World Series <laughs> Poker. Wow. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there's other okay. packages. How's that kind of podcast, Adam? But uh, <laughs> we're talking about the World Series Poker package. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it'll be the same as always. Yeah, okay. we, we'll, I'll release it. We'll see sometime in May and we'll be do. I'll do the same thing. I'll give 25 percent to people at no markup. And this time I'm this year, I'm going to win two years in a row. People that put money up have gotten less than they put in. So this year, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that, you know, we come out uh, in, in the what is that? Not the red, the black. Black. Yeah. Black. Otherwise, next year you're gonna have to sell a point nine five or something. Yeah, right. I don't want to sell. I sell. <laughs> I don't. People say like it's so funny. I still get people go, "Wow, why do you have to sell for like a fifteen hundred dollar buy?" Because I sold. I went to Toronto, which we'll talk about. I sold for the two K. You know, to give people sweat. It's like, "Wow, why do you have to sell for the two K?" And I'm like, "Like, 
yeah, I can't believe I still have to have these conversations <laughs> about, you know, like what, you know, why I'm doing it. People think I'm taking advantage of people. I'm like, I yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about uh, 2024 so far, Daniel. Um, you know, obviously at the end of 2023, you documented your results from that year and uh, you were going to make some changes. Um, and uh, it seems like you have, you, you've taken days off. You've, you've uh, been on talking about that on social media and you've had some great results. Uh, uh, you know, you've played uh, some PGT series. You've got a win three seconds, a third and 600 K in caches, I believe. Uh, you're sitting fourth on the PGT leaderboard. I might have my math wrong there. You're, you're mm-hmm. sitting, but I do know you're fourth on the PGT leaderboard yeah. uh, with 896 points. So off to a great start. Um, is it putting some of that stuff in, in motion that you were talking about at the end of 2023? Yeah. Well, it's two wins. One of them doesn't count for this season because it was like the the last thing before the PGT Championship. It was the first event of the year. I won that, but it's still a 2024 calendar win. But yeah, I've made a lot of final tables, like leading the PGT in caches and all that sort of stuff because I've been there. And I'm one of the few that plays the PLO. I play the mix. I play the no limit. I play them all. Um yeah, one thing I'm doing this year, which I think is going to be a lot of fun because it breaks people's brains. And obviously the easiest brain to break is Mike Mattisau's. And so what I'm doing <laughs> is I'm tracking like meaningless stats, really. I'm tracking, okay, how do I do when I show up on time? How do I do on a late ridge? How do I do on bullet one versus bullet two versus bullet three? How do I do as a max late ridge? Um, so I'm tracking them all separately to see. And so I tweeted out, you know, before uh, the series, something about like, basically my second bullet is crushing, like my second bullet, which is automatically a late range, right? And of course I tweet that and I, 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 I literally tweet the headline. These are completely meaningless stats. So go ahead and make, you know, you know, try to find like, and so Madison goes, see, I told you late range is not fair. Da, da, da. It's like, as though this sample is like relevant in any way, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, so I've been, well, I've been focusing on, just feeling how I feel physically. Like, and I'm, I'm skipping the five case, for example, to lead the series off because they're not worth as many points. Um, uh, if I play deep, you know, and I get late, I'm in there late. I don't show, I don't force myself to like get there on time now. Like I'll take a little bit extra time and late reg and just I'm getting more rest, you know? Um, and it's funny because I'm already, I still feel like by the end of the series, like I actually skipped the 25 K in uh, one of the last series. I didn't even play it. Cause I'm like, you know what? I'm just too tired. I don't feel like doing it. And I was out of a point race, so I just said, screw it. But that's what I'm doing. I'm just, like, being more comfortable with FOBO. And, like, if I don't feel ready to play, I won't. Like, I played the 25K. I was a little bit tired, um, the last one here. So I had a couple – I had. I don't do this, but I decided to have some beers. Go. I was on stream having a blast because, honestly, it's like a PED for me. When I drink beer or alcohol, I, I just destroy. I crush. And I was <laughs> doing quite well, but I, I bubbled the tournament. I got Jackson against King Queen. Um but yeah, that was sort of like, um, what do you call it? Because that's my last tournament of the World Series. So I'll, I was using my special uh, secret PED to give myself. Dazzle, dazzle. Yeah. yeah. If you remember from the vlog this year, you might not remember. <laughs> dazzle, dazzle. When you got, I remember you uh, left the Stanley Cup championship game, or whatever it was, game seven, and you were playing the 10K Raz. Oh, God. Yeah, and, I remember uh, that. Right. Yeah, that 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 vlog. Barely. Yeah. <laughs> so you said probably wasn't the only one who left Game Seven and jumped oh, in there a little, little hammered. less than optimal. Everybody was hammered. Yeah. You're sitting in seventh in the uh, GPI Player of the Year race. Um, there's an Indian interesting story. Know. What's that? I know. I forgot the GPI was even a thing. Honestly. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm leading up to I'm leading. I'm trying to get somewhere with this. Uh, sitting in twentieth. Uh, a player that's uh, caught everybody's attention this week. And it's a great story. It's Victoria Livschitz. And uh, she's coming off caches in five of six events, including four final tables, I think, at the latest PGT series. Um, and, and just I was going to ask you about what do you think of the the field sort of makeup now compared to last year, compared to years previous? I don't imagine or I don't know. I haven't seen Victoria in the field before. So I'm wondering if there's more people like Victoria um, that are playing these fields, or is it still sort of the same uh, people? And it's rare to find somebody that hasn't played in these events anymore. No, that's uh, that's what I sort of was touching on. That like this sort of being quote unquote seniors week. We had Eric Afriot. He had a second and a first. You know, you have like, and you have some other people that just have money that like just enjoy it. You know, there's a and I'm yeah, there's Ed Sebesta, who's you know quite a, there's a, there's a, there's a good amount of people who are like you know what this is fun you know. 
And I think a lot of them come in understanding that they're playing with a bunch of pros and they're okay with that because it's entertaining. And like you said, because they do cash sometimes, I don't think they have any like disillusion that they're like, you know, a favorite over like Stephen Chidwick and Sean Winter or whoever else. But it's, it's like a fun competitive thing to do, you know? And I think it's good for the mind too, especially as you get older. Like I was just talking to uh, my wife, Amanda about this and just how, you know, like dementia or, you know, losing your faculties, um, is delayed by, you know, game playing. And, you know, this is one really good way to do that. So yeah, we are seeing, you don't, well, you know, you're not seeing a bunch of like young kids, you know, coming in here and playing. It's, it's mostly people that are, you know, independently financially okay. And they can afford to play 10 Ks and stuff like that. You do see some younger guys taking shots, typically the first couple events, the 5k, maybe, you know, a 10 K or two. But yeah, I think it's growing. You know, the numbers are consistently like, you know, doing well. We had to make some adjustments to the tour a couple of years ago before we had 100Ks and 50Ks, and it's gotten smaller in that regard um, for a couple of reasons, just, you know, for like taxes, the Canadians don't come because of that. And then, you know, we had the issue with uh, a lot of the Asian players who don't come for other reasons, you know, for the other issues they had. So uh, those were dying at the higher stakes. So I think now like, you know, 25K being like the big one is, uh, is what you see for most of the uh, series. Yeah, we could take, you know, I was thinking about this. You take a step back and just, you know, marvel at the job that Kerry Katz has done with and how, how he's changed the poker landscape, really, like in a few years, right? I mean, how old's PGT? Three, three four years, feels like. Something like that. And, yeah, I, he, yeah well, I think, I don't know, he, I, it feels like it's been longer than that. But um, yeah, I think for like a lot of us who live here, it's like a really fun, everyone loves playing in the studio. It's like people that play there, they're like, this is where I want to play. This is the spot. It feels like the pinnacle. Feels like you know, uh, we- like Wembley or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just so convenient, so comfortable. You know, food, drinks, like just you know, you don't get bothered as much. You know, like if I was going to play in a regular poker room, you know, you'd have a lot more people walking in and out. But there, you know, there's like, I mean, people are allowed to come into the studio, but most don't because they're like, you know, I don't know, it seems a little intimidating, and whatnot. But it's great. It's like it's it, with that. I mean, before that existed, like, what would I be playing right now? just the world series of poker basically so it's a nice way for players like myself and i think it's fun i think it's like it's a it's a fun series which has substantial money available to players like the top 40 you know are entered into a free roll for one million dollars at the end of the year so and again and the rake is low too not that i give a shit because you know it's me but like you know if you show up on time you get like a significantly reduced rate like the 25k you show up on time it's 200 bucks and you show up late, you know, if you rebuy, it's 26000 So it's $800 break on the refer. And that's important, too. That was one thing we learned about starting tournaments, like especially high rollers, is you have to get them off the ground. You just have to get them off the ground. Because often what you'd see is like a bunch of pros thinking like, oh, let's see how the field looks first, you know? And now you only got like three, four people there. And then all of a sudden, you know, the recreation players are like, I don't, I don't want to play a four-handed, five-handed tournament. And that's kind of what we saw happening, right? So then, you know, you make the switch to sort of incentivize the people to show up on time. They all do. People still do come late, but it goes off when, you know, when it's supposed to, which was a smart move on their part. I think even didn't even like 10Ks, like mixed games of the World Series have that problem. Like, I feel like some of the 10Ks of mixed games of the World Series, they, they were like, they're, and yeah, barely no, going off. I mean, like you said, I remember one year with a 10K limit hold them. I think I texted you. It was like 18 to start or something crazy yeah. like that. But yeah. I text you and I said, these are the 18 you want to play with. So get yeah, over there. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then I end up at your table. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, that's, and that's still an issue. But I think, you know, we've sped up the structures a little bit on the first. Well, we made one change. It was levels one through six for 40 minutes. Now it's going to be one through three. Now we're back there. But, you know, the, the 10Ks, the, you, showing up level three level, you're playing for meaningful stakes. Like you can go yeah. broke. You can go no, broke in, in like, you know, one, one bad round easily. All right, let's talk about uh, the World Series of Poker Circuit event that was held in your hometown of Toronto, Woodbine Racetrack. Uh, you flew up there, and um, yeah, I guess just talk about the overall experience, what it was like. I know I saw there were some registration issues and long lines and restricted sort of uh, on the cap on how many players they could have there at Woodbine, but um, just your your general take on, on going home to play some poker. I was actually blown away by this place. The Great Canadian, it's called. Um, it's like five, ten minutes from the airport. It's like five, ten minutes from where my brother lives. So he picked me up. And uh, it's massive. The place is really big. And the demand 
for something like this in Toronto was evident in the numbers that we saw show up. For the main event, there was three flights or four flights, I think, and there was a 405-player cap each one, right? And that's all we had room for, for this first you know, trial. And there was people waiting six hours to get in. Like they just couldn't get in because, you know, it was just, I say this, if with a rebuys, if they had enough room, that tournament, which ended up with 16, 1700 players, it, it gets 12,000. I'm not even kidding. Like I'd, I'd show up in the morning and say hello to all the people in the line and take some pictures and this and that. And I caught up with a lot of old friends. And I'll tell you what, a lot of people that, you know, cause I put a little piece up on poker stake for the fans. A lot of people would have assumed that I just played the 25K PLO, flew there the next morning. I'm playing this 2K after doing media all morning, doing TV, all this stuff. People thought like, oh, he's just going to punt his in. I tried my ass off in this tournament. <laughs> I grinded so hard. I was, I didn't, I ended up cashing in the tournament. And I was like, I was there from hand number one. I was like trying to pick up as many reads as I could. And, you know, it sort of dawned on me, like I was talking to Chewy about this uh, at the table last night. Like when you play, I play at the studio all the time with the same guys. All right, you know, it's not a whole bunch of stuff to pick up anymore. You know, it's, it is what it is. When you sit down with a whole bunch of players playing in a 2K that are all, you know, beginners or whatever, there's so much information available. Like so many, like so many just, you know, player tendencies, so many physical tells, all this sort of stuff. So I was doing my best. I was really like zoned in. I was sitting there with some sheet metal worker guy and I'm sitting around, you know, just like regular folk. It was really nice to kind of, you know, see. In a way you have to work harder though, because you have to learn, like, I've never seen this this guy or this guy or this girl or whatever. Like you actually have to work. Like what are their tendencies? You play down with the studio regs. Like you already know how they play. You like, you, you want to pay some attention, but it's, it's a lot more work to play with like eight guys and girls you've never seen before. And what I will say though is by paying attention, like if you, for those of you that play these and you're just on your phone the whole time, you're missing out so much freaking value. It's actually going to be meaningful. Like when you're in level seven or eight, this guy moves in on you and you, you just go, I don't know, whoa, whoa, what GTO? I guess I have to fucking randomize. No, this guy didn't bluff all day. Not once. He showed the nuts every single time. He's got it. You know, like know these things and it's going to give you a big advantage. And I, like I said, I was trying really hard, which was a lot of fun. Um, and as I really do love those big field events, but again, you know, with my new strategy sort of for the world series, I won't be playing them because sort of what Terrence pointed out, it's a mental drain too. Like when I played the gladiator and here too, on the break, like on the break, I didn't organize a meet and greet, but a <laughs> line, like on a literal, just like they were all orderly cause they're Canadian, eh? Good Canadians. They all just lined up. Like, it's like their time to get a picture and have me sign something. I'm like, all right, I guess, you know. That's what I'm here for. So, but yeah. How'd you get to the bathroom? Huh? How'd you get yeah, to the bathroom? I had a secret spot. I got the little, the lady would shush them away after a while. And I would get, <laughs> but I will say oh, this, okay. that place, that place for a ma- massive tournament has incredible potential. There's a theater where, you know, they were telling me they could add like hundred, 150 tables. Right. Now you do that, you can open it up and you could actually run like a real big Canadian poker championship of some kind with maybe a 10 K and some high rollers and things like that. But, I'd say by, obviously, like you said, it was just the, the, the issue with it was it was too popular. Like so many people wanted to. And that's, if there's a problem, that's like usually the best problem you want to have is like, you know, an, an overabundance of demand to, to get in it. And that, that like, again, for their first trial, like you sort of test the waters and now you see what you can bring in. So for next time you can prepare to have, you know, five times the number of players. Uh, So you finish up there and you fly down to Cancun right from Toronto. Did you go right from Toronto? Yeah, it was a, yeah, like I said, the trip was madness. I showed my wife the the itinerary for me and it was like upon landing there, media stuff and then play, right? So that makes you, then the next morning, like 6.45, I'm like going downtown, I'm doing breakfast television, I'm doing like different TV spots, running around, coming back to the casino. And then I also met, you know, with uh, some people from GG, you know, had lunch there. And then like directly from that, after the interviews go straight to the airport and boom, off to Cancun to meet uh, Amanda there. And so, um, yeah, it was a whirlwind trip. And then Cancun was fun. Obviously Josh. Yeah, the rundown. So Josh Aria's wedding, um, lots of fun, lots of poker players and destination weddings. You guys have all heard what uh, Larry David says about destination. Wedding, right? Yeah. He's yeah. For sure. Um, and Cancun, I didn't realize this, but from Toronto, it's actually quite easy to get to, but from Vegas, it's a bitch and getting back was a nightmare. We had we had the nightmare trip from hell where the plane we had to get off of it because it was broken, blah blah blah. Um Amanda had some had a rough go of it because well actually first of all, then that morning I flew in late, I was exhausted. Next morning, eight AM we're supposed to go golfing. 
And, you know, they, I, it was like, I just was, no, I couldn't make it. So I bailed on them for golf. And uh, that co- then we had like the cocktail party that night and it's on the water. And uh, we learned something, Amanda and I, that she's wearing, you know, a beautiful dress and I was wearing a suit or whatever. And within seconds, she was swarmed by mosquitoes and I'm standing right next to her. And I got bit zero times. Okay. They did not want any of my tofu, seitan, fucking vegan bullshit blood. Right. Amanda got bit 45 times. Okay. Mm -hmm. And think about for like a woman, all of her back and all this kind of stuff. So the next day, you know, for the wedding, she was going to wear a dress, but she's like, how am I supposed to wear this now with like disgusting bumps all over my back, you know, from mosquitoes and stuff like that and her legs and everything like that. So that was rough for her, but you know, she's a trooper and, uh, (laughs) We, we made it, we made it through and I, I put some spray tan on her to try to cover up the bumps. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, ah, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, it was a fun wedding. It was a blast to see a lot of old faces. Uh, Boston Rob and Amber were there, caught up with him. And then I, you know, turned me on to his new show, which I'm up to date on now. The, new, the deal, the dealer, no deal Island. It's, okay. uh, it's really cool. I don't know if you've seen it, you know, Rob goes on there. It's, it's, it's not survivor, but it's like, Combine some survivor elements with the game Deal or No Deal, and like Rob is on this island, and he's completely uh, out. He's like putting on a reality TV clinic, like he knows what he's doing. And there's just a bunch of knuckleheads who don't know what the hell's going on. And you know, it's it's a, it's a really interesting watch. It's really really cool. How uh, it, it actually it's a it's a it's a system a format that actually gives him a chance because anytime Boston Rob goes on a reality show, he is like target number one. They know who he is. They know how good he is. So there's always going to be that faction of people who are like, get him out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I don't give away any spoilers for those that want to watch it, but it's it's worth the watch. We were going to set an over under on how many uh, people you would go to a destination wedding for to fly off and get a, a couple of people. Did that. Lists, right? It's a low number. Yeah. Very low number. But okay, Josh, so are we considering people that are all, are, so I'll set the total and you guys, you guys pick Dan. If you have that, that was the question I had, cause I got two numbers in my head and it's for, is it, it for people it, who are a group of people, people who are not married already? Right. That's got to be the question. So it, let's it's be a, say, how about this? How about we'll say of Daniel's friends, married or not, if they were going to get married, would they go? Would Daniel and Amanda go away for their a destination wedding? Like Italy? whether they're married or not? Yeah. So, so 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 somebody could be married for like twenty years, but yeah, you know, like, like Daniel's got to pretend like they never got married Daniel, to begin with. Well, that's Daniel's so good. Daniel's dad's wedding. It's, it's easier more, with people that aren't married. It's easier to do with people. Yeah, that, people who aren't married. Are. I'm married. I don't know who's married and who's not, so it doesn't doesn't give me. So anything. people that aren't married, that's going to be a much lower number. I say I'm going to say the total is going to be uh, three and a half. Wow, that's exactly the number that I was that that was literally I was trying to debate between three and four, and that was that was exactly what it was. I guess I'll take under that, but. It, <laughs> That I it's I was exactly gonna say three. A good book. What can I say? Yeah, yeah. 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 Let oh, Ross well, I, I was gonna say because that that was the number I had I had come up with as well. It was, you guys it all was had three and a half, and the, we all had three and a half. The three names that I thought of were Alan Kessler. Ironically, <laughs> if he had if he had a desk, he destination be, wedding, wow. If somebody, married. if somebody like if somebody comes to a ballroom in like Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> Well, why would I go to that? Just ironically, I thought it would be funny. Well, he's not getting well, married. That's never happening. Like, you that's blog that's thing. My number okay. was just off the top. My I had it at like four and a half. So you know, oh. I didn't think of any people in general. Like I just thought, you know, there's probably around that number of people. Okay. Okay. Amanda's is like between zero and zero point five. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going again, especially if there's mosquitoes there. She's definitely not. Oh. Out. Yeah, the destination should be the Arctic. <laughs> yeah, there's big mosquitoes in the Arctic for sure. Uh, so right. it's wondering, we did figure out the thing. It's not because I'm vegan. It's a blood type thing. So mosquitoes are attracted to certain blood types, and she has a blood type that is very attractive to them. And I have one of the most rare blood types. Uh, is that I'm true? Negative. I have like one percent. One percent of the population has my blood type, approximately. Did you look this up on a real website or like one of those? Like, it, this is, is a true fact. Oh, yeah. Blood type affects mosquitoes. Yeah, mosquitoes are okay. So you can Google it. But yeah, I mosquitoes are, are attracted to specific blood types more than others. All right. I'm not knowing my blood type. I don't know my huh? blood type. I, I don't didn't read it on fucking Alex know. Jones, InfoWars, or anything like that. You, <laughs> you should know your blood type. Like, what if you get in an accident? I know. I feel like an idiot not knowing it. 
Uh, all right. Um, we're four Canadians, and we've got the greatest tournament in sports coming up here starting uh, Saturday. This is the Stanley Cup playoffs in the NHL. And each year we kind of go through matchups and we'll uh, make our picks. Last year was kind of uh, a miss. Um, we didn't do well last year. There was a lot of uh, strange results in the first the first series. Uh, the, the, in other the, words, I crushed you all with my my well, knowledge. From what I understand, we still owe you money for that. You do, you do. I I I took Seattle in the first round, like just just. Let's well, remember. There, uh, there might have been more than one that took Seattle in the first round, but anyways, we didn't do well in the first round. You did, we didn't. <laughs> um, but anyways, so this year uh, the matchups aren't set. Uh, we have one more day in the, the regular season. So we're not 100% sure of the matchup. So how we're going to do this this year is we are going to do a snake draft of uh, the 16 teams because we do know the 16 teams in the playoffs. Um, and we've done a randomizer, uh, Terrence. Uh, so there's 16 teams, four of us. We're, we're each going to pick four teams, 100 bucks each. Terrence gets to go first. We'll do a snake draft. Oh, you, did, you told me in the chat that you were going first. Okay. I don't mind. You're first. I'm second. Uh, I'm first. Okay. I'm third. First. Okay. Gets fourth. That's. I. I wanted to be second actually because I yeah. wanted. I wanted between Carolina and Florida, and I. I feel like I would have just taken. I would have been happy with whatever one you didn't take. Okay. I mean, I want to take Florida because they were there, but I think it's Carolina's turn. Carolina was really good. Picked up Gensel. Uh, yeah, that's that's the thing. You know, they, they were already good. They picked up ones. It would be my first pick if I was first for sure. All right, uh, I wouldn't have been mad with Florida. Ross, are you gonna uh, keep notes here and and as we go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my team. I'm going to pick the New York Rangers uh, with my second pick. I wish I could go to the West, but West is so hard. Any of six teams could win the rest probably. Uh, so the Rangers are my pick, Daniel. You. Well, what about the President's Trophy curse? Yeah, there's that. Not a real thing, by the way. It's not a real thing. Uh, Daniel, you're on the clock. I will go with... Let's go with... It's a close one between those two teams. Maybe I'll get them on the... On the I'm going to get them on the comeback. So I'll take the Dallas Stars. Wow, nice pick. Yeah, Dallas, definitely. Uh, all right, Roscoe, you for two. All right. I was just taking down the notes for what you guys picked. And I went, D-A-T. It's spelled out dat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I've never figured that out before. Um, all right. So I will go Edmonton. Wait, and you didn't know one. that Poker Podcast was Daniel Adam and <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? You got another one, Ross. You get two. Okay. No, I was just kidding. Oh, okay. um, I will take Edmonton and I will take Colorado. Damn. Edmonton, Colorado. Those are two solid picks in the West. That's where uh, I was going, Colorado. Okay. So now I need a minute. Okay. I should have taken an East team, I guess. Damn. That's that was that was that. You sniped was Daniel. You huh? sniped. You sniped Dan. He sniped you. Yeah, but like both on both spots. Those were both. Fucking... I know a certain team that you cheer for. Well, two chick teams that you cheer for are still available. Yeah, understood. But well, like, if I'm trying to win, you, he might want to actually win money. <laughs> 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 oh boy, oh boy! I'm being fucked. Okay, so it's not you guys are going to take Vancouver. I'm I'm not about it. I'm not doing that. I'll trade you Colorado for Boston. I mean, Washington's obviously running really hot right now. Oh yeah, they're, yeah. it's just like the guy, the team that I should take. I don't, I don't even think they're going to win the first round. Who's that? Florida. Yeah, it's probably Florida. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this is ridiculous. Hold on, Vancouver. Who the hell can I possibly take? Now, you really fucked me by taking Colorado. I'm going with a Canadian team, eh? I'm going. Oh, I'm going. Connor Hellebuck and the Winnipeg Jets. Why Winnipeg not? Jets. It's a solid pick right there. They could beat everybody. Uh, all right, I will take the aforementioned Florida Panthers. Yeah, it's too too obvious at that point. I mean, if Absolutely. if you let me, if you let the Panthers slide, I mean, that would have been nice. You get two, Terrence. This is. I think there's like a big drop off now. Yeah. I think I think we're at the point where we've hit the drop off, and like all the the contenders are just kind of done now, right? So, oh boy, who picks? Wait, you just. I did. I mean, it's on me. It's on me twice. Did do I have to take the hated Bruins? Do I really have to do this? Do I really have to well, take the hate? to cheer against the Leafs, which is always... Oh, that's true. 
That's true. It's always actually that's really right. That's really fun watching in Boston own the Leafs every you single year. You haven't taken Vancouver yet. But... No, Boston. No. Yes, you're right. I haven't taken Vancouver. They're in the hunt because I, the second pick, I, I think is just not that easy. Like I, maybe I just take Tampa because I didn't get Florida. Like or fuck it, I'll take Vancouver. Let's go. Let's Three, go. Eight, Let's go. And who else? You I got, did. No, I, I that's two for me. Who? I got Boston. I got Boston and Vancouver. I got the I got the wrong season. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna snipe uh Daniel again and take the Vegas Golden Knights. No, you weren't sniping me. Oh wow. No yeah. no faith in the home side. The the Vegas long term injury reserves. So let me yes. see here. Okay, so we've got as Phil Hamid always says the lacerated the Vegas lacerated queens. Bro, bro, let's go, got, eh? Oh, yeah, we, Toronto Maple Leafs. Let's go, Leafs. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Toronto. You got him. Uh, Roscoe, um, too. Boston's still available? Yeah, I'll take Boston. No, no they're no. not. I put Boston. Taking notes. You should know that Boston's not <laughs> No, you took Vancouver. Yeah, what I took picks. I'm right. the top of the draft. Yes. Okay. okay, I missed that. And I will take. Um, I need someone from the east, Tampa, yeah. and LA. Okay, Tampa and LA. Uh, back to you, Terrence. Or no, sorry, back to you, Daniel. No. Daniel for two of them, right? No, no, just the one. Just the one. Yeah, it's just one. There's three teams left. Oh, there's three teams left. I don't even know who's left. Three Nashville uh, Islanders. I get stuck with the Capitals. Fuck that. In the Capitals for sure. I'm getting stuck with the Capitals. That's bullshit. Nashville Islanders. I'll tell you what. In honor of Roman Yossi, who I'm in for in ever indebted to because he helped me win my fantasy league for the first time since 2011, my fourth title. Best day, best day of the year for me. Uh, whatever Roman Yossi does, I want to be a part of it. So I'm going to go with the Nashville Predators. That was the best when you you uh, finished second in your tournament, but you didn't give a shit. About well, I mean, I would have liked to win the tournament, but. If I had to pick, I definitely would have picked like winning my fantasy. It's so much harder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and battling back from a 3 1 uh, deficit in the, in the yeah. uh, best of seven, right? Roman uh, Yossi. Yeah. Terrence, you get the uh, Capitals. I will take the Long Island Islanders. You know what? Like, the, the Caps are running good, right? You know, they just, they're just going to have the future greatest goal scorer of all time. Minus 37 goal differential. He's coming. He's coming. Pot. You know, just just pot empty netters in a one one game. How good do you run? All right, uh, that um, before before we move on, I I actually made something quickly before we started. Okay. Shot is coming. Shot is coming. Come on, shot. The Sharks are officially the worst team in the NHL. Thank you, you Daniel. Bet. That one, yeah. my, there one you go. my big bet. I've been I parlayed Oakland Athletics worst team. And I parlayed that into San Jose Sharks, worst team in the NHL. And can we talk about worst team or something else? How much it was close. If Connor Bedard misses a few more games due to injury, I mean, it would have yeah. been a tough one. It would have been a sweat. It was. It was. Chicago was the worst for a little bit. It got got a little sweaty. Um, well, I cashed out a little bit after the A's. I think this one was about twenty five hundred. Nice, good hit. Yeah, I thought you yeah. uh, you were retired from sports betting. What happened to that? I'm only doing futures now. <laughs> It requires less discipline. I can, I can uh, just bet all my money and then not deposit again. Yes. They don't count as <laughs> features. They don't count. They're not sports bets. I don't know what you're talking. Exactly. <laughs> They're investments. Uh, all right, that's going to wrap it up for us this week. Uh, thanks to you guys for getting together. Oh, oh, wait, we got we got to talk about Neymar quickly. Oh, did you see that? Yeah, that was awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of sports, that's the best. <laughs> One of us and. The uh, the industry guy pointed thought, thought in my mind. He is he still on Poker Stars payroll? Because he was clearly playing on on the most popular poker site in the world. Oh, was it? I thought I thought it was one of the app sites too. I don't even know. Okay, I thought it looked like it looked like anymore. He's double G. Be anymore after that. No, no he, was, he was epic. Um, I, you'll you'll splice that into the into the the YouTube version of the show. Yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, oh, Neymar do that. None of us would do that. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Super good. There, but there was a time where one of us would do that. I think. 
It's man. not like the kid knows, man. Exactly. The kid's won. Yeah. The not game the- was good. It was a good game. It's not the kid I'm worried about. The guy in the guy in C two, man, he's just blasting off. You got to get this action. Yeah, Adam, <laughs> you've never had a, a laptop at the dinner table with your kids or something like that. No, I have not. I must say, that <laughs> I kept the two separate. Your kids were older though; it didn't count. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, all right, everybody, thanks for you guys. Uh, thanks to you guys for getting together. Uh, thanks to you guys out there for listening. And uh, go Canucks, go! That's right. That's right. <laughs> Only I believed. Only I believed. Peace out, boys.